Welcome to Industry Focus, the podcast that dives into a different sector of the stock market every day. Today is Thursday, November 15th, and we're talking pipelines. I'm your host, Nick Seipel, and today I'm joined by Motley Fool contributor Matt Delalo via Skype. How are you doing, Matt? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing well. You know, I was talking to, talking to you before the show. We're getting the first snow of the year down here uh, in the DC area. You know, I just moved up here a few months ago uh, from down in Alabama, so I'm uh, adjusting uh, the best I can to this this new weather. But we're doing all right. Yeah, my wife and I went the opposite direction. We moved from the north to the south to avoid the snow. Yeah, so we'll make it. But uh, anyway, it's 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 been a new experience for me, and uh, you know, I'm sure many more days to come. Oh yeah. All right, Matt. Uh, first off, on the show, I wanted to talk about the fires out in California. And you know, first off, for all our listeners, just want to say, you know, our thoughts and prayers out to everyone that's been affected. You know, there's been multiple people who've passed away or have been dis- dislocated from their homes. Some people that are still missing. But since we're an investing show, you know, we want to talk about how these sorts of things are, are going to affect affect investors. And the biggest story this week related to the California fires has been PG&E. Uh, PG&E is the largest utility in California, has over 5 million customers. And it's down over 50% this week. I saw this morning it was down, uh, again, another 20%. Um, uh, about over rumors that a defect in their equipment may have been to blame uh, for causing you know the wildfires that are really ravaging California right now. Um, Matt, I just want to ask you. You know, investors in a company like PG and E, you know, they bought into a utility stock that's supposed to be stable, pay a dividend over time, be very predictable, and now, now you're seeing you're seeing this this liability coming up from the fire that has really just changed the whole narrative for the company. Um, when you encounter situations like this in your holdings or your investments, what do you think is the best you know appropriate way to respond to something like this that just comes out of nowhere and just changes the entire dynamic of the business that you're you're holding? Yeah, I mean, this is a tough situation. Um, again, my hearts and prayers also go out to those in California. My uncle lives out there. I know that they've um, experienced some uh, just the the smoke in the air is making the air quality bad. So, just it's a tough situation for those people out there. So, um, it is hard to then switch gears and talk about investing. Um, you know, investors are just losing money, which nobody wants to lose money. But you know, losing your house or your life, it's so I guess an investor should frame it that way first. It is money. Um, it's really not ever fun to lose money. But um, and especially the type of investors that would be in a stock like this, they're looking for the dividend. It's the low risk investments, and it's a reminder to us all that there's no such thing as low risk in investing. There's things that come out of nowhere. Um, there's the BP disaster a couple of years ago. And um, you know where that company, you know, they made a mistake and you know created this huge uh, environmental disaster. In this case, you know, we have the fires here that potentially were caused by an electric malfunction. Um, if that's the case, it could really devastate the company because they could be held liable for a lot of this damage. Uh, I saw that they had uh, taken out their line of credit so that, you know, the banks basically gave them a, a credit card and they maxed it out and, um, put that cash on that balance sheet. And that's kind of preparing themselves for not being able to access money in the future. Uh, if they're held liable, they're not going to be able to issue bonds or sell stock. So it doesn't look good for investors here. Uh, I saw this happen a lot during the oil market downturn where companies that were about to go declare bankruptcy, they would max out their credit. Facilities so they had that liquidity. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say rush out and sell because you don't know what's going to happen, but um, it, it doesn't look good for investors in this stock. Yeah, you're exactly right, Matt. I mean, it's it's just hard to know where to proceed from here. There's so many unknowns. That, I mean, if it turns out that they're not liable, I mean, of course, you've got, you know, whatever, a double, you know, uh, if it were to return to the previous levels, but it, it, it's it's just so hard to know. And there's just, there's just so many question marks in the air. Yeah, I would not be buying hoping for that to happen. I mean, as a human being, you hope that, you know, the fires are put out quickly and that, um, you know, as a, for the people that work for this company, that they don't go bankrupt. But, um, I wouldn't be buying on that, that hope. That's right. That's right, Matt. Well, let's kind of pivot into, you know, our main discussion today, which is, which is pipeline companies. And the first company, uh, we want to talk about is Crestwood Equity Partners. Um, they're an MLP uh, pipeline business. They, they yield about uh, a little over seven percent. They're about twenty eight percent year to day. They kind of have fairly well covered uh, distribution, about a one point two uh, distribution coverage ratio. Uh, when you look at Crestwood Equity, what really stands out to you about that business? 
They've done a lot over the past couple of years to turn around. I've been watching them for a little while. I actually bought um, some, um, they're called units earlier this year uh, because I saw the turn in their financials. Their leverage ratio, which is the amount of debt they have to earnings, has gone from over five to around four. And then their coverage ratio, as you mentioned, is up 1.2. It was pretty flat for. Uh, it was they were paying out more than they were bringing in for quite a while, and um, so they they sold assets. They cut their distribution a few years ago. They partnered with a bunch of companies uh, to bring in cash, but also to help fund growth. So they've done a lot to turn around, and that's turns finally starting to show up in their financials. Uh, the third quarter, they uh, I think their earnings were up about. Eight or so percent, um, which is good for a company that had been steadily declining. So it was nice to see that turn, and that turn is going to accelerate going forward. Uh, they, they've had success in it. so what they do is their their main business is gathering and processing, and that's taking uh, natural gas basically from the wellhead, and they'll take that and they'll separate out the natural gas liquids. And it's a it's a business that's very dependent on volume. So as natural gas or as oil and gas companies are drilling, the volumes go up. And so that's been one of the the, the things that has kind of driven them lately is this uptick in drilling, especially in places like the Bakken where they've got a, a good position. They're also in the Delaware Basin, which is part of the Permian, and uh, the Powder River Basin, which is out in the Rockies. So they've got these three growth engines that they're they're starting to uh, finish up some projects. And as those projects are coming online, it's allowing companies to to drill more wells, complete more wells, and that's really starting to accelerate their their growth and their their starting to take off. Yeah, let's talk about you know some of those uh, you know new pipeline investments that are coming online. You, you mentioned kind of partnering with some other businesses. You know, in the Delaware Basin, they're working on their Orla uh, natural gas processing plant and, and pipeline. Uh, they've announced a, a joint venture uh, for the Nautilus or, uh, Orla pipeline. Uh, with Shell Midstream Partners to support support what Shell's doing, and then similarly in the Powder River Basin, um, they're partnering uh, with Williams Companies to help support the growth of Chesapeake Energy. So, kind of latching onto these producers um, who they're servicing. What kind of advantages does that give to them? Does that give them some steadier cash flow opportunities because they're partnered with these producers? Or give some color on on kind of what that means for for the business. Yeah, I'll go through. Um, we'll start in the Potter River Basin, where uh, they're working with Williams Companies to support Chesapeake Energy. Chesapeake's one of the bigger drillers out there, and um, Chesapeake really sees a lot of growth potential out in the, that area. Their um, production's up, I think, like a hundred percent in the past year, and you know, obviously off a slow or a low base. And um, but they're they're putting more rigs out there, and that gives. Uh, Williams and Crestwood visibility. They can tell, okay, Chesapeake's production is going to grow by X percent. And so to support that, we need to build these gathering pipelines, which will take the, the, the raw production from the well to these processing plants, which separate the natural gas from the natural gas liquids. And so they get paid fees as they do this, you know, so as the volumes go up, the fees go up. So it's a really good visibility business. It is tied to, um, uh, we call the supply side versus the demand side. So, as drilling, it's really driven by drilling. And so, with oil prices until recently going up, this this has been really driving that. So, by working with um, both Chesapeake and Williams, they have a very good idea of what's going on as far as um, planning how many wells. And then Williams, they help fund half of it. So, for a company that's paying out, you know, with a 1.2 coverage ratio, that's probably like 70 plus percent of their cash flow. They don't have a lot of retained cash to, to reinvest, so that's helping them with that. And the same thing with in the Delaware Basin, working with Shell, um, you know, obviously a massive company. They have their own NLP, and they're working with them to kind of to uh, follow along with what Shell's doing, and so that they can time these gathering pipelines coming online. And you mentioned the Orla plant; that's the first one. They'll probably build the second one there. So it's really being able to, to time these plants so they're not building a, a natural gas processing plant on speculation, but just okay, we know that the volume is coming, and so they can make that return very quickly. Right, and and as a result of these these investments, um, Crestwood is, is projecting a cumulative annual annual growth rate in their cash flow per unit at fifteen percent through twenty twenty. So they're really thinking that these there's some significant growth opportunities. 
Um, and, and you know, we've discussed the Bakken and the Permian in the past, and just the real opportunities for once we get this infrastructure online, for that you know growth to really uh, that lever to really get pulled, I suppose. Um, you know, looking forward for Crestwood, you know, over the next few years, you know, if an investor maybe wants to start a position or wants to kind of start following the stock, you know, to think about maybe starting a position in the future, what are the things that investors really should watch going forward or pay attention to with this business? Well, one of the things I like about Crestwood is that they're focusing on growing earnings per unit. You know, or you know, we would if you have the stock it would be per share, but focus on the individual growth as opposed to absolute, and that is what will create value more so than oh, we're going to grow you know double the business. But if they're issuing a whole lot of new shares to do that, it really doesn't help the investor. So I like that focus on the per unit, and that'll make sure that they're able to grow uh, the the distribution. Which uh, you know, this is a income focused stock, uh, so as they're able to grow that distribution. They probably won't grow it at 15% per year, but um, you know they might grow it by five, six, seven percent a year, which is be more sustainable. That will give them more free cash flow later on to invest, reinvest into um, new projects. So I like that it'll be a steady grower. Um, you know, you're not going to see another 30%. I I doubt it um, in the next year, but a good steady grower um, with uh, the distribution. All right, Matt. So the next stock we're going to discuss is Brookfield Infrastructure Partners. Uh, key thing to point out with Brookfield Infrastructure, it's more diversified than Crestwood. They they also have some, in addition to having some some pipeline investments, uh, they also have some investments in data centers. They have some investments in regulated utilities. Um, they yield about four four point eight percent. Their distribution has grown at eleven percent cumulative annual growth rate since two thousand nine. What really stands out to you about Brookfield Infrastructure? Well, as you mentioned, it's diversified. It's it does have the the pipelines. Uh, they've got a pipeline through North America. They've got one in Brazil. They're buying one in India. So not only do you get the North American that you can get, you know, in any of these MLPs, but you get the the global uh, pipelines. And then in addition to that, they're just savvy of knowing what um, type of infrastructure is needed elsewhere. So you mentioned the data centers. That's you know they see data as being the new oil. Is just being, you know, it's exponential growth in data. So they're uh, investing in cell phone towers, data centers, fiber networks, uh, and then they're also big on uh, things, transportation type businesses like ports, toll roads, and um, uh, rail. So they're really a broad way to diversify into infrastructure generally, and um, so it's a it's a different way to kind of play this side of the market. Yeah, I guess the way to think about it with with Brookfield Infrastructure is if you need to move something from place to place, whether it's data, oil, you know, goods on a toll road or anything like that. I mean, that's something that they're going to pay attention to and look for opportunities um, in that space. Um, right. uh, about ninety five percent of their adjusted EBITDA comes from regulated or contracted revenue, so you're getting a pretty steady cash flow um, through the business. So you get your it's a very predictable um, business. Let's talk about their acquisitions because a lot of their growth. You talk about you know with their cash flow being re- relatively steady year over year. A lot of their growth is going to come from acquisitions, and they just announced about 1.8 billion dollars in new investments. 1.4 billion of which is going to go into uh, energy, um, while the rest of that is going to go into data centers and some other opportunities. You want to talk about what they're looking at with, with these new investments and what opportunities Brookfield has uh, to pursue there. Yeah. So one of the things that Brookfield does is they'll buy a business and they'll own it for a long time. So they just sold a uh, electric transmission business in Chile, and they're using that money uh, to reinvest in some other higher growth opportunities. And uh, they've got about six deals going right now. One of them is they're buying Enbridge, um, the big Canadian pipeline company. There's a uh, gathering and processing business in Western Canada. It's focused on the Montney Shale, which is a natural gas liquids type of shale play up there. And um, you know, so they they see that as a growth opportunity to uh, as as Canada starts exporting natural gas and um, it has really good returns up there. So they see that as a good organic growth opportunity. They also are buying a pipeline in India. Uh, India is going to India is the faster growing energy market going forward. China was the big story of the past you know couple of decades, but India is going to grow very, very fast in the next couple of years. So they're, this is their kind of inroad into India. And um, they also bought a, uh, a residential infrastructure 
company, what they do is they lease things like uh, home heating systems and um, water heaters, those sorts of things to homes and businesses. Uh, so that's kind of their energy investments. Uh, and they also bought a, um, a utility, a gas utility in Colombia. So again, spread all over the world, diversified. And as you mentioned, a lot of these are contracted cash flow. So just like a pipeline company will make uh, sign a long-term contract with shippers. A lot of these are long-term contracts. So you got that stable cash flow. And then they have the, the data infrastructure investments. One's a deal with AT&T to buy some data centers. And another, they're partnering with a, a real estate investment trust to buy some data centers in Brazil. So again, you've got that diversification both in sector and then in geography, geographically. So it's, um, it's a, a way for them to grow faster than a typical pipeline company because they have so many more opportunities. And another benefit of this kind of switch from the Chilean business to these other ones is the Chilean business is going to grow about 2 to 3% a year. And they see these as growing, I believe it's 5 or 7% a year organically. So can accelerate the growth rate plus um, just to get the uplift from uh, you know a really stable business to a businesses that are growing faster. So they see this as accelerating the growth rate going forward. Yeah, Matt, and let's talk about you know kind of the advantage we talked about you know the diversification that Brookfield gives you because uh, mm-hmm. you know they're not just in the oil space. How does that kind of insulate them? You know, a lot of these other you know energy oil plays can get affected by the cyclicality we see in the energy market. Um, is Brookfield more insulated from that just because they have opportunities? You know, if the oil market's you know doing really well and then the assets are overinflated, they can push assets to the, those other areas where it's data centers and things like that. You know, for an investor, is that a thing that that you kind of think about when you're deciding how you want to allocate or go into these businesses? Yeah, they're very contrarian. So they'll look at a situation where nobody else wants to invest, and that's when they'll buy. Um, I think it was two years ago. Brazil was in some trouble. Uh, the oil prices really hit. Brazil's um, pipeline or their um, oil company Petrobras pretty hard, and on top of that, they had a political scandal, and so nobody wanted to invest in Brazil, and that allowed Brookfield to buy um, this really good pipeline business for um, you know a fantastic price, and so that that focusing on looking for opportunities when nobody else is has enabled them to get some really good deals. So right now, um, the midstream sector is under pressure in North America. Nobody wants to buy midstream assets um, the, because with interest rates going up, that's kind of put pressure on stock prices. So these midstream companies are selling them to Brookfield for pretty good values. So that's that's how they play it, is they look for um, opportunities when things are down, and that's when they'll pounce. Yeah, I, I pulled some some data, I guess, from one of Brookfield's investor presentations earlier this year, and you, you talk about the markets in a downturn. and. Brookfield's uh, balance sheet kind of sets them up to be in a good position to invest there. I think they have less than five percent of their debt uh, is maturing in the next five years. Ninety percent of their debt is at a fixed rate. They have no significant maturities in the next five years. So you know, while while we're at the this is kind of bottom or weakness in the MLP market, I mean, they really have the opportunity without significant obligations on their balance sheet to really throw some money into you know where those opportunities present themselves. Yeah, and that's that's by design. They like to sell assets not when they have to. But when they're at full value, so for example, Enbridge, they, they sold their Western Canadian um, gathering processing business because they had to. They um, the market put a lot of pressure on them because their their debt load has been you know higher because they're building all these pipelines all over the world, you know all the the, the uh, U.S. and Canada. So they needed to delever, and that provided uh, Brookfield the opportunity to to buy. And so that's one of the things that kind of sets them apart is they'll 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 sell when the values are high, and that that hurts them in the the short term. Like their earnings have gone down the past two quarters. Um, however, that gave them the cash to buy a bunch of you know really good assets when prices came down. Awesome, Matt. So just kind of going away on, on on Brookfield, you know, again, if an investor wants to start a position or wants to you know start tracking this this business to maybe think about starting a, a position in the future. What should they be following? What should they be be paying attention to? What are the important things that you know they should be tracking uh, with this company? Yeah, so they have a like we mentioned six deals going on right now. So their focus right now is closing those deals, and if they all close, they believe that it will boost earnings twenty percent um, starting second half of next year. So there there might be some pressure in the near term. Uh, fourth quarter earnings might be down. Um, they did close some deals recently. 
but you know, I, I see there's an opportunity to buy. I just bought not that long ago. And the focus on them is they're the long term. They're looking, you know, three to five years and they believe they can grow their distribution by five to nine percent per year. And it, it'll be more generated by the organic growth that they can get from these businesses. They, they have a pipeline, um, joint venture with Kinder Morgan, for example, that they're expanding. They have, um, some other businesses that they, they're building these, you know, little small projects that can increase earnings. So that's going to drive a lot of this growth going forward. Um, you know, and then the acquisitions, if they can get good deals, it's kind of like icing on the cake. Okay, Matt. Uh, awesome. Let's, let's go ahead and talk about our last stock we're going to talk about today, which is mm-hmm. Plains All American Pipeline, ticker PAA. And it's exactly what it sounds like it's a pipeline company. That's all American. It's in. It's all in uh, North America. They own uh, gathering terminal and storage facilities in California, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Texas, and in, and in Canada, they're in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Yields about five point two percent. Has more than ninety percent of its cash flow tied up in long term contracts. What stands out to you about Plains All American? Plains All American. Even though you mentioned how diversified they are, they're really a Permian Basin story. They've got one of the best positions there in the Permian. And they've got a lot of growth projects uh, in the pipeline, so to speak. Uh, they just finished uh, the Sunrise expansion pipeline. Uh, that's taken crude oil up to um, Wichita. Um, uh, and then it's going to go up to Cushing, which is kind of the nation's uh, oil hub. Mm-hmm. Then they have another one um, that's uh, the Cactus 2 pipeline. It's an expansion of another pipeline that, that'll take oil to uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, which is a big... Um, hub down along the coast. So they've got these these projects, and they've got a lot of other little. They call them deep bottlenecking projects. To look for you know, there's too much oil flowing in one direction. So how can we fix that and invest in capital and, and get a, a return and, and improve the flow of oil? So they they're really focused on the Permian, which is a great place to be. It's growing. You know, it will grow so fast once they get these pipelines online in the next year. Yeah, Matt, and you know we've talked about the Permian in the past, uh, about you know the pipeline constraints there and how it's really kind of held back production in that region. As these pipelines come online, so a, a couple questions here. First, because there's a shortage in pipelines, what kind of leverage does Plains All American have? You know, in, in you know negotiating pricing with the producers there, and then secondarily, as these pipelines come online. How quickly is their capacity going to get filled up, and we, you know, reach another bottleneck again? Because there's a massive number of drilled, nu- drilled but uncompleted wells. This kind of latent demand in the Permian. What are your thoughts on those two kind of questions there? Well, one of the things that the the pipeline crunch has kind of enabled uh, planes to do is is be able to secure partners. Uh, they have this partnership with Exxon Mobil. It'll be kind of the next Permian pipeline that. Will probably be built, and Exxon signed a you know big long term contract to be an anchor shipper on this pipeline, and um, you know the the pipeline companies have been able to do that is get big producers to kind of anchor these pipelines, and that, it it de risks the project so that smaller producers are okay with signing on with them, so that that's kind of helped them uh, plan ahead and get the next ones lined up. So this pipeline. It'll probably be like a 2021, and so that'll. Now they're starting to get ahead of the curve. Uh, there's, I think there's three pipelines that are supposed to be finished by the end of next year, and then Energy Transfer and Magellan. They've got a pipeline that's coming 2020. So they're basically staging them almost every year, and that should help them get ahead of the curve, as long as you know there's no permitting issues or other problems like that. So they they've it's really helped them to to just be able to get producers to to focus on, yeah, I need to sign on now so that I can grow later. Right, because if these producers, you know, it's the problem they've been having now. If you can't, if they don't have some kind of pipeline deal to get the oil out, I mean, it's it's a useless asset. I mean, you're selling your oil below the spot price and all those sorts of things. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about too. You know, uh, that uh, we're seeing um, Plains All American, you know, building out all these new pipelines. They've also, you know, sold some of their assets. They sold. I guess their their bridge tech's asset, fifty uh, percent stake in that uh, to Magellan, Mid- Magellan Midstream Partners. That they're going to use that cash to kind of delever a little bit. What's their balance sheet looking like at Plains All American, and uh, what's kind of the prospects for that going forward? Yeah, that's been the driver. They they sold a, a lot of assets in the past couple of years because they, like a lot of companies, had a, a little bit too tight 
um, when the oil market crashed. So they've been trying to get that leverage ratio down. They expect to hit their target uh, early next year, and that's going to free them up to do some other things. But uh, you know, and that's where, like in the case of Bridge Tax, they they sold. They didn't sell the whole thing. They sold a part of it, so they can still keep that. But there's a there's kind of a disconnect in the market where Permian pipelines are selling for ridiculous prices. So they, they're cashing in on that and then using that cash to build new Permian pipelines for a really good rate, rate of return. So they're, they're kind of making a really good trade there. And, um, you know, then as these pipelines come online, the cash flow will go up. Uh, it's already starting to happen this year and they're projecting, I think, 12% growth next year. So you have this growing cash flow stream coming at a time that their balance sheets are getting better, and that's going to free them up to uh, start increasing their distribution. Probably next year, um, they, they're talking with their May um, payout that they'll probably increase it, and they could do any number of things. They, they're going to be covering their payout by like 190 percent this year, so it could go up substantially, or they could hold some back so that they can build some of these projects. Um, you know, we mentioned the, the Exxon pipeline that they're, they're trying, you know, so Exxon's going to help fund that. They've got another joint venture partner there. So as they secure more joint venture partners, it's less, uh, capital they need to put up and that's more potential growth for, um, the, the distribution. So that's what I think is interesting about them is this, this, they're heading into this period of growth, their balance sheets getting better. And, um, you know, they're pretty cheap. So uh, it's a really interesting um, company. Yeah, Matt, I mean, uh, all these things seem to be lining up. I think, you know, anybody can tell there's a, you know, massive shortage of pipelines in the Permian and that there's going to have to be investment there over time. I guess what would have to occur to kind of disrupt this thesis for Plains All American and really all the pipeline players, you know, supplying into the Permian? What would have to occur for that kind of? direction it looks like we're moving when it comes to pipeline demand there for that to be disrupted well all this oil is flowing to the gulf coast and which is good because there's a lot of refineries there but there's only so much that the refiners can handle so uh, the some of the companies oil companies are, are kind of concerned that the um they, they call it the the wti brent spread so wti's west texas intermediate that's kind of the, the domestic oil price and brent is the global oil price so there's a ten dollar barrel difference, and they're worried that that's going to widen. And so, unless you have access to exports and can sell your oil at Brent, then you know it's the same thing with producing the Permian. Now you're selling at a discount. So unless companies start building more export capabilities or more refineries get built, then we're going to be in the same trouble. Um, you know, at ten dollars a barrel, and um, there's a hundred. Uh, the U.S. produces 10 million barrels a day. That's $100 million that they're potentially losing out with these pipeline issues and this infrastructure issues. So uh, one of the things Exxon's looking at doing, and that's why they're partnering with Plains, is they're um, looking at building a new refinery or expanding a refinery. So that'll, you know, Exxon will have this, you know, cheap source of oil that they'll be able to refine and make more money. So you'll see these kind of downstream investments where companies will look at. Uh, how can we make money on this um, this discount? Are they going to build uh, export terminals? Are they going to build new refineries? So that's kind of where the focus needs to be: is how are they going to use this oil now that they're producing it? Sure, Matt, and, and maybe maybe you answered my question then. So I mean, if of what people should watch if you're going to start a position in planes or, or kind of you know monitor it going forward, is that is that refinery capacity the thing that you should be really paying attention to, like kind of downstream or what are, what are the things that you know investors really should focus on to make sure that growth story is still playing out? Yeah, that's part of it. Like the the nice thing about a company like Plains is they they already have long term contracts for the the pipelines that they have, so they pretty much know where that cash flow is coming from for the next couple of years. It's more of where's the growth coming after 2020 in this case. You know, they're, they're pretty confident that they're going to build this pipeline with Exxon. There's a, another pipeline that they're looking at. Um, up in, um, I think it's Oklahoma. So that, uh, and that'll move uh, oil down south as well. But in a, you know, it's like, where's the growth coming next? Uh, they know the Permian is going to keep growing and growing and growing. But if we're not going to be able to get that oil to global markets, then the growth is going to stop because it'll just, it won't be, um, profitable as profitable to produce. So yeah, I would also pay attention to what's going on downstream. 
look especially at uh, export export capacity. Um, there's a lot of companies that are trying to do that. Uh, uh, Philips 66 and it's it's MLP. They're building some export capacity along the Gulf. Um, yeah, so that that would be a something I pay attention to. Okay, Matt. And then then last question going away. This is general market. Uh, but if we come back and record this podcast three years from now, do you think there will still be pipeline constraints in the Permian? And the Permian, um, probably not. It seems like they they might actually you know overbuild um, at at this point. Just just the, the the amount of pipelines they're doing now, and private equity companies are also involved in there, and they tend not to. Um, they they they'll build more on speculation than a lot of the publicly traded companies. So. I wouldn't be so worried about the Permian, but we might run into pipeline issues elsewhere, or like I mentioned, um, you know, just so much oil flowing to the Gulf that they just can't handle it. Awesome, Matt. Well, great to have you on as always, and I, I'm sure, you know, this stuff is only going to continue to develop going forward. You know, we've seen, you know, the oil market just the past year. You can never know what you're going to get. It goes at all time highs, and then we're we're tracking down again. So I mean, this has been a fun story to follow and look forward to having you on again to uh, continue tracking it. Yeah. Yeah. It makes my job fun. Yeah, (laughs) exactly, Matt. Well, thanks so much. All right. Thank you. As always, people on the program may own companies discussed on the show, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against any of the stocks mentioned, so don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear. Thanks to Austin Morgan for his work behind the glass. For Matt DeLalo, I'm Nick Seipel. Thanks for listening and Fool on. 